Praise God. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's good to praise God. Praise God. Amen. Let's remember the end of the message that that's just not the time just to walk out the door, but that's a time to spend a little bit of time with Jesus. Amen. And see, perhaps, if something that was said that day from God's word would would uh, be important, at least for us as individuals. Praise God. Again, it's good to have everyone here. Good to see faces I haven't seen in a while. I will not call you out by name. <laughs> but it's good to see you here. Praise God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Some of us would not even have to open our Bible. We already know what it says. Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No apology. Just the word of God opens up with just that statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the faces of the water, the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then turning to the very last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. Verse 11. John says this. He's in the Spirit. And he sees into a world that you and I can't see into right at this moment in this room. But he sees into it. In fact, he sees into the future. Almost, well, well, over 2,000 years now. Well, a little bit over 2,000 years. And he says, now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. And it talks about him. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. I'm waiting to discover that name. I don't know it. And neither do you. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white, and clean, followed him on a white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hmm. I want to preach to you for a little while today. By the way, we don't need a lot of in and, in and out. We're getting too much of that. Children, you need to behave. You need to be sitting by a responsible adult that can correct you. And if you have to correct the adult, well, then they need to get responsible. Amen. But I'm going to preach you this morning upon the, the debilip, debilitating factor of humanity. The debilitating factor of humanity. Would you pray with us right now? Lord Jesus, again I come to you. You are excellent. You are excellent. Your splendor is far beyond my ability to describe. Your glory of God is beyond anything that I can imagine. It is a wonderful thing to be able to come into your presence. 
Help me, God, never to take it lightly. Help me to treat your presence with respect and honor. Oh, God, it's not a plaything. Oh, God, what an awesome thing to be in your house with you today. My God, bless everyone here, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My God, my God. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what the word of God says. Every time, most every time you will read in the scripture when a, a Jewish individual prays, invariably they are going to talk about the God who created the heavens and the earth. They're going to mention that in their prayer. Now they're not praying that because God needs to know who he is. They're praying that because they need to know who he is. Hallelujah. They need to understand the majesty and the glory of God. And it's very difficult for us as humanity to grasp and lay hold of all that God is. In fact, we can spend a lifetime of wanting to know his glory and every page that we turn just gives us another aspect of him. And we will stand in amazement of just how wonderful he really is. Now I fully realize this morning that not everybody's caught up in his glory. There is a lot of things that detract from that. Uh, amen. Some of us, and I'm just I'm not trying to be ugly when I say this, but we have been hardened by sin. And when we're hardened by sin, you don't see the glory of God. You don't see it. In fact, you could walk right by it and not even recognize it. With people who have come into his presence and whose sins have been washed away and who have become very sensitive to him, they find themselves in a position where sometimes... When they're in his presence, it's so overwhelming that they have absolutely no words that they can add to what's going on. Now, I read to you this morning, and I was wondering how your response would be as we read those scriptures. I was wondering. I, I didn't encourage you to do anything. I just wondered to see what you would do. But the Bible begins with the fact that God is God. He, does, he makes no apologies for the fact that he created the heavens and the earth. He doesn't even ask you to believe him. He just says this is how it is. Hallelujah. And then I get to the book of Revelation and I see the other side of this thing. Long the history of mankind and it's finally coming to his conclusion and I read about him being this one who comes on a white horse and fire in his eyes and out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword and, and that's very scriptural. You can read it in Thessalonians and other places. And he's dipped in blood and it's not his blood. Some of us may think it's his blood but actually it's the blood of his foes. Those who have defied him, whoever they may be. Hallelujah. And then I read, hallelujah, the, these words, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It may not move you. You may not fully grasp it today. You may not understand it today. But I would hope that you would pray, God, Give me an understanding of your greatness and your glory. I tell you, when that happens to you, you will approach him differently. I tell you, when that happens to you, you'll have no problem getting into an aisle and asking for prayer. 
In fact, you'll push somebody out of your way to get there. Because you just know that if his name is called over you, that something's going to take place. <laughs> it's the truth. When you see his glory, you know that miracles are not something of the past, but they're very present right now. And that it is very possible, and even yes, today, that somebody here today who's hungry and thirsty for God could be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and would begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And it's very possible today that if there's a heart of faith here today that says, you know what, I've never been baptized in the name of Jesus, but I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus today. And it's very possible, in fact, it's very real that their sins would be washed away today. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, somehow today, if we could just paint a picture of the greatness of God. It would help us greatly. I will not have adequate words in my vocabulary. I will not be able to give you some kind of a speech that somehow would enthrall you, amen, and grab your heart, amen. I just am inadequate in those areas. I don't have that ability in myself to give to you the understanding of how great God is and that he truly is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And even as I say that this morning, there are people that struggle with that in this audience. I know that most of you are not historians. I know that most of you know very little about the history of our world. I know most of you could probably not even name the seven wonders of the ancient world. I know that we think that we are so advanced and so, so uh, creative in this day that there's never been anything in the past that quite rivals us, amen, in our intellect and our abilities. But I'm here to tell you you're sadly mistaken. You would say, well, we've invented the computer and we, we have the ability to store upon, I mean, it's files, just reams of knowledge that are just incredible. And I would say with you, that's true. We can do that today. But I can tell you about men that lived long ago that had understanding and wisdom and knew things that are no longer a part of our history as a people and they have become obscure to us I don't know if you've ever read the, word, the, the book The Art of War it's required reading in the military today for leadership it wasn't written in, in the, the 20th century it was written long ago in China hallelujah and today its philosophies are followed. And you'd be surprised what those men knew back then, what they'd come to an understanding. I suspect sometimes they just didn't get as distracted as we are. We're distracted by everything around us. We're distracted by entertainments. We're distracted by television. We're distracted by the internet. We're just distracted by a whole lot of stuff. And most of it is quite trivial. But we're distracted by it. But they weren't. They were thinkers. We, we see the evidences of the past, and I'm going really slow, and somehow i got to pick this thing up. We see the evidences of the past, but, amen, but we don't see how opulent that society was, and we don't, we don't grasp. The, we just see its ruins, and, and amen. We know that somewhere in the past, amen, it would, they had to have an incredible society. We don't know much about the Aztecs or the Mayans. We don't know much about the Assyrians. We don't know much about the Edomites. We don't know much about Petra. You ever heard of Petra? Amen, Petra. Amen, the ISIS has tried to destroy all those things in that area. 
amen, because they're monuments and they, don't, they want to completely deface them and rid this world of, of historical memory. We don't know much about the kingdoms of that past world. We consider our world to be far superior to theirs. But let me take you back to the book of Daniel for a moment. Let me take you back to a man who is the head of Babylon. And we think that Babylon is so primitive, at least in, in our society today. And we think that, that we are so far advanced. Before we f had our first Persian Gulf War, there had been a reward offered by Saddam. He wanted somebody to tell how they had been able to cultivate and bring water to the hanging gardens. And most of you don't even know what I'm talking about right now. Today they still don't know. They will speculate about the pyramids and how they came to be. And, and, and again, some of the stuff they come up with is quite crazy. You know, aliens came down from the sky and just all that kind of business. And, I, I, you know, it, it, it tells me they've been watching Star Wars and Stargate and all that business. And they've come up with all these wonderful what they think is how it happened. But I'm here to tell you, men have known a lot of stuff for a long time. And so when Nebuchadnezzar has a dream... And nobody can interpret the dream, and he's not sure about it, whether it was about himself, and he's ready to destroy every wise man in his kingdom and start all over again. But he finds a man named Daniel, or Daniel finds him, and in Daniel is the Spirit of God. And he will tell him the dream, and he says to him, Amen, in Daniel chapter 2, that you are the king of kings, referring to Nebuchadnezzar, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And he says in verse 39, but after you shall rise another kingdom that is inferior to yours. Amen. What I didn't read to you is the fact that it was an image of a man, and the image of that man's head was of gold. And that the splendor and the glory of Babylon could not be compared to any other kingdom, that it was the top. Now, you can't even find Babylon anymore as far as a nation, a city. You can find the mounds where it was at, and you could dig into the earth, but there's nothing there now. If you were to go to Berlin today, you would find in its museum the gates of Ishtar. At one time, those gates were at the entrance of Babylon with lions, amen, on both sides. And of course, now it's all faded and it's all a distant memory and, and there's nothing in it that is real impressive over the, only the fact that it's old. But at one day, it had splendor. And if you were to read in Daniel here, chapter 2, God begins to explain through Daniel just how things is going to be. And he talks about a kingdom, of course, of gold and a kingdom of silver and then bronze and then legs of iron and then toes of iron and clay. And he lets them know that your kingdom is quite a much, it, it, all these other kingdoms are much inferior to your kingdom and of course, then he mentions that last kingdom, and he says that last kingdom is going to be terrible. Ferocious, grind nations to powder. And then, in the course of telling him these things, Daniel will say to him that this dream is certain, and its interpretation, sure. And this great king Nebuchadnezzar will do something that many of us won't do. Nebuchadnezzar falls on his face, this great king, prostrate before Daniel. 
and actually commands that they should present an offering and incense to him, which I'm sure Daniel said no. And the king would say to Daniel, truly, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. So this king who later will be humbled and become like a beast himself humbles himself before God and acknowledges that he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords if just for a moment. Only brothers and sisters, we could understand today just what we're a part of. If we could understand today that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. If we could just get a hold of that this morning in this house. If we ourselves could bow our knees to our God ourselves and not rely upon some old man that we don't know nothing about today who's in the pages of ancient history. Paul himself in writing to Timothy would say that at the Lord Jesus Christ appearing Amen, which he will manifest in his own time. Amen, verse 15 of the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy. He who is blessed and the only potentate. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light. Whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. He wasn't just trying to fill up the end of a chapter. He was talking about the glory and the majesty and the presence of the almighty God. I think we ought to praise him this morning. I think we ought to exalt this God that we're trying to serve and live for. I think we ought to lift him up in this house. Hallelujah. 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 Ha. Ha. In, Sam, in Psalm 72 and 11, it says, Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. I mean, that is not a fantasy, that's a fact. Paul would cast himself into the future through the spirit and he would say in Philippians chapter 2, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and of those on the earth and those under the earth. That, that encompasses everything, whether it's human or spirit, amen. Every knee is gonna bow and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, hallelujah. You are the Lord. You are the Lord today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh my God, my God. My God, my God, my God. My God. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hosea would say this in the 11th chapter. He would say in verse 9, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man. Hallelujah. You must remember who we're serving today. He's not a, he's not a man. He is God. 
for you that are trying to figure God out and for you that are criticizing God for what's happened in your life and all the things that you've gone through, all the things that you've struggled with, you got to know something today. The book of Isaiah 55 and verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You ain't on the same page with God. You don't know what God knows. You don't know his ways. You want to know his ways. Oh God. Oh God. Janice said it, Janice said it earlier to us. Amen. We, we are moved by a beat. We are moved by music. But oh can we be moved by the fact that God is God. And that there's nobody like him. Amen. That in the heaven and the earth. That he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Can that move us this morning? Can that get us off of our keister and on our feet and praising him? Can that do something to us today? My God, my God, my God. My God, my God. My God. My God, my God. My God, my God, my God. My God, my God. The year was 2010. You may be seated. The year was 2010. My brother fell and broke his hip. He already had had surgery to fuse his neck. He'd been dealing for quite some time with a spur that has grown into his spine and was crippling him, and a spur that was growing into his throat. And the doctor said, We can't do anything with the one that's going into his throat because. With all of our abilities and all of our wisdom, if we were to go into that area, we could very much paralyze his ability to speak and even to swallow. And so they would not touch that. Now, my brother is limited in his mental understanding. And so when he was being rehabbed, he would struggle. He would get angry. He would yell sometimes, which is quite unusual unless it's the bears and the brewers and the bulls I can't forget them recently I was sitting in his room and we were listening to a brewers game on the radio and somebody jacked a home run for brewers and that guy that's laying on that bed yelled and I I mean they could hear it out it woke Calvin up who's sleeping back there right now it woke Calvin up <laughs> amen he was sleeping in my brother's room It did. It woke up the guy that was sleeping in the bed across from him. It sort of woke me up too because I was in a slight daze myself. But he, uh, when it came to rehab, he just, he fought it. He, he would not cooperate. And so because they can't force you to rehab, he wasn't in rehab. And so I watched him as he began to wither. If you see him today, his legs are very, very bony, very thin. His arms do not have the strength that they had at one time. In fact, I went back to when my daughter got married. And I looked at a picture of him. He had gone to the wedding with us in the, Indi in the Indiana area. And, and he looked so much different than he looks today. Now, if... He needs to go to the bathroom. They've got him in Depends. If they want to get him out of bed, they've got to get the Hoyer lift and they've got to put him in a chair and he will remain in that chair until they take him out of the chair. He can't shave. He can't wash his teeth. Or wash, yeah, wash his teeth. Yeah, brush his teeth. He, he can't wash his face. He can't take care of himself. Now, if you'd have told him and if he could have understand some years ago, what would happen to him? I'm sure he did things differently. But you see, now he's so debilitated that he, unless God does a miracle, he will never walk again. He's debilitated. He just, he is, has none of those abilities. His strength has been reduced. It's been impaired and feebled, and he's very weak. That's where he's at today. He's been debilitated. 
Well, I'm here this morning. We've been getting a little excited about God. But let me finish this message up by talking to you about the debilitating factor of humanity. That there is something that cripples us. That there is something that weakens us. That there is something that impairs us. That makes us extremely feeble. You start reading about it early in the scripture. You read about in Genesis chapter 3. You read that when Satan says to Eve, you'll be just like God. You're not going to die. That she will eat of it and give it to her husband. And one of the things that so attracted her to it was the pride of life. The ability to achieve on your own. The ability to be, have so much intellect that you can all figure everything out. And make it happen just because you're just smart. So, she eats of the fruit and, and of course her husband also eats of the fruit. I don't know what they were thinking. I do know that they had a wonderful relationship with God. I do know that they were very unique. The Bible says that they were a little lower than the angels. That's what the scripture says. I, I, I know those things. I, I know. and Amen. And I, that he was literally the governor of the entire earth. That God had put him on the earth to subdue it and reign on it. You can't ask for a higher position. But somehow just that attraction of just being like God was enough to grab their attention and they would eat. And then when God would address the issue and Adam came out of hiding and he said, well, I was naked, God, and I was afraid. And God would say to him, who told you you were naked? I began to see this debilitating factor of humanity. It was the woman that you gave to me. It's her fault. I'm like I am right now. I'm talking about the debilitating factor of humanity. The fact that we refused to accept our responsibilities for what we've done and the consequences that it brings with it. And we want God to magically remove all those consequences. And when he doesn't, well, then we got an attitude about God. Hallelujah. I see it again. When Cain in anger slays his brother. And I'm sure he tried to hide the body. But you can't hide anything from God. And God comes to him and says, where is Abel your brother? And the response of Cain to me is so arrogant and insolent and prideful. For he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And I see this debilitating factor of humanity grab him. And it will propel him to where he's outside of the presence of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you cannot accept responsibility for where you're at, I'm telling you where you're going to eventually end up outside of the presence of God. I see it in some of the writings that are not in the Bible. I will tell you this right now. They're not in the Bible, but in the antiquities of the Jews, which was written by a man named Josephus. He talks about a man named Nimrod, who the Bible spends very little time talking about in chapter 10, amen, of Genesis. It just simply says he was a mighty hunter uh, before the Lord. And then you start reading about his kingdoms. And one of those kingdoms happens to be Babylon. 
And so Josephus says this, just, just stay with me. Now it was Nimrod, he says, who excited them to such an affront and a contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it was through his means they were happy. But to believe that it was their own courage which procured their happiness. Now, I, I could spend time here because, man, my God, it's like it reaps off the ancient script of Josephus and it smacks us in 2017. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God. You understand what democracy gives to you? You got no clue. You don't understand what democracy gives to you. It gives you the freedom to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you don't understand that, you're a fool. I know I'm name calling now. I mean, but I'm just telling you the truth. And so he also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into constant dependence on his power. And then it says this. You can read it. I can show it to you. Amen. The, the, Joseph, the antiquities of the Jews. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. For that he would build a tower. You ever heard of the tower? Too high for the waters to be able to reach. And that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. You see, I'm here to tell you right now, that is the debilitating factor of humanity at work. Excluding God, arrogance, pride. I'm going to do it my way. It's my way or the highway. I don't care if I've got it wrong every other time that I've done it, I'm still going to do it my way. I don't care how bruised up and battered I am. I don't care how messed up my life is. I don't care where it's taken me. I'm still going to do it my way. The debilitating factor of humanity. I see it as Moses stands in the court of the Pharaoh in this place of extravagance, in this place where it exudes power and authority. And he says to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that we may behold a feast in the wilderness. And I see that debilitating factor of humanity at work. It says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. I see it in Rabshakeh as he stands outside the gates of the city, which is called the city of God, Jerusalem. And he says to them on the walls, who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? You're going to find out. If you read the rest of the story, you're going to find out. Because they did find out. I read in Psalms 10 and 4, the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Okay, I, I don't have time to expound, but you hear what he just said. The wicked, they don't seek God. If you're not seeking God today, what category does that put you in? And if God is in none of your thoughts, what category does that put you in? He speaks of the, so the, the tongue in Psalms 12 and the tongue that speaks proud things who has said, with our tongue we will prevail. In Psalms, amen, 12, 4. Our lips, our own, who is the Lord over us? Now, I'm spending a lot of time talking about this right now. And many of you out there say, this don't, this don't have anything to do with me. And, and you are so wrong. It has everything to do with you. 
Well, I go to church. I, I, I got the Holy Ghost. I got baptized. I'm trying. Listen to me. It has everything to do with you. The extreme is what it says in Psalms 14 when it says the fool is set in his heart and many of us can finish it. There is no God. And because of no God, they are corrupt and they have done abominable works. And there is none who does good. I'm talking to you about the history of man. I'm talking to you about the debilitating factor of humanity today. That's what I'm talking about. I'm preaching to you right now. I'm coming right where you live. Amen. Before this is all said and done, you're going to have to look at yourself. And if you refuse to look at yourself, you're being very, very foolish. All of us in this room should humble ourselves and bow our knee to him and acknowledge that he is the Lord. But, but some of us have already convinced ourselves that we do that. We just, we just do it in our own way. Our own way. Our own way, preacher. Don't tell me. Yeah. Just that very spirit is an indication of where you're at. So when Samuel's wept all night, because Saul disobeyed God. And he's cried because he had all the hopes that this man would be the leader that Israel needed. And he has failed dismally. And he comes and, and Saul just gives him a performance like many of us do. Or we give the performance. I've done what God commanded me to do. Well, if that's the case, where, where's the evidence? Where's the fruit? Because if you've done everything that God commanded you, there is going to be some visible fruit in your life. And Samuel would say to him, because he uses the excuse, I brought all these animals back to what? To worship God. To offer them as a sacrifice. And he would tell him in verse 22 of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed and, or to listen than the fats of rams. And then he makes this statement here. and Of course, we're going to disqualify ourselves from this area. He says... Rebellion is as the what? The sin of what? Witchcraft. Yeah. It has not changed. If we are rebellious towards God today, it's like the sin of witchcraft. And not only does he say, I know this is not going to go far with a lot of us that want to pat on the back and be burped a little bit and told how we're going to be wealthy and healthy and all that kind of stuff. But I'm preaching to you as the pastor of this church and as a man of God, and you need to hear what the word of the Lord says. Not only is it rebellion, but he, he tells us that our stubbornness is as iniquity, which means lawlessness. And Idolatry, And not a one of us today would go and pray before an idol. Wait, well, I wouldn't do that. But our stubbornness has set up an idol in our lives. And that idol is none other than ourselves. Oh God, oh God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul addresses the same area when he tells us because they knew God and they did not glorify him as God nor were thankful but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. And professing to be wise, they became fools and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and they began to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so what does God do? He gives them up to their perverted ways. That's exactly what he does. He gives them up to their perverted ways to dishonor their bodies. And they exchange the truth of God for the lie. What's the lie? 
you're God. You ain't God. You even had a day when you've been close to being God. And they worshiped and they served the creature rather than the creator. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you still in the house with me? I need, I need to get this thing done here. Oh, help me, God. Help me. Help me. And so, all of that is a debilitating factor in my humanity. I have no problem in myself resisting God. I know what the Word of God says about my flesh, that my flesh is literally hostile to God. It has been that way since Adam. And I may be the pastor of this church, but I am very capable of operating in my flesh. And I'm very capable of literally being hostile to the ways of God, even if I don't seem to recognize it myself. I would not be the first person that's been blinded to their condition. Help us, God. Help us. Oh, I pray today that we would rid ourselves of that which debilitates us when it comes to our God and the possibilities and the potentials that he wants to work in our lives and through us to other people who are desperately in need of him. In Deuteronomy, the, what they call the second giving of the law, in chapter 10, it says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor, nor takes bribes. Just, just hang out with me. I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, I'm getting there. All right, all right, all right. All right. If you read the story of the Old Testament settlement of Canaan, if you read about the conquest, you will remember or you will note that Reuben and half of Manasseh stay on the west side of Jordan. And they stay there because they're animals. They, it's plains, it's an area where, where the animals are going to be. And so they, they, uh, they stay there. Initially, when they asked to do that, they're told that, you know, you still got to send the men over. The men still got to fight for the rest of Canaan because you could discourage your brothers by just saying, I got what's mine and I don't need to help anybody else. And so they go over and they fight. And then when they move back, they do something. They build an altar on the west side. Now, it's not significant to you, but to every Israelite, it was very significant. Because you see, they've gone through the Baal of Peor, where 23,000 died. They've, dealt, they've watched as Achan was stoned to death, because he chose to take that which belonged to God and hide it in his tent. They've seen that. And it's impacted them. And the last thing they want to do or the last thing they want to see done is somehow having God addressed just as any other God that you would make an altar to and all of Israel comes down to parley with Reuben and half of Manasseh we want to know what's going on here what are you doing Hasn't our history proven already what happens when we don't worship our God and when we serve other things? You see, that's, that's where they're at. In fact, amen, they, they, don't, they don't understand. Why have you rebelled against God? By, don't you understand that our neck is in the news too? Hey, brothers, hey, moms and dads, if you don't want to serve God with all your heart, don't you understand that your children are also having the neck of the news put around them? If nothing else, serve God for your kids. And so they, and so they gather, and I'm telling you, they, 
They're, it's a serious business. This is not a plaything to them. In fact, they're willing, if they hear the wrong answer, they're willing to fight. And they're willing to wipe out every Reubenite and every Manasseh individual that's on that side of the river. They're ready to do it. Why? Because they've come to understand how important it is to serve only God. And they've come to understand that the best thing you could do is fall on your face before him and obey him in every aspect of your life. And so they find out. The only reason we're building this altar, this is just merely, in my words, a replica of the time that we offered sacrifice here, all of us. And in the years to come, when we're all dead, dead and gone, and... And some of you that were not there, and if you, if you want to understand this, you just go back to Joseph. He was the savior of all of Egypt. But in the process of time, they forgot what Joseph, Joseph had done for them. And they enslaved his people and his family. He said, so listen, the only reason that we are building this, this altar is as a witness to all of us that when they come and say what's your part in this we say we fought with you too we worship the same God you worship and with that the tension will ease out and they'll go back to their homes the debilitating factor of humanity the subtleties of it Many of us are so confused right now. We don't even understand that what we're doing, the subtleties of how we operate. We make decisions. We don't even consult God. We even make major decisions that don't insult God or consult with God. We don't, we don't go to Amen. One of the things you always read about David when he is right, he's always asking and inquiring of God. If you want to be a man after God's own heart, you got to learn to inquire the Lord. Should we do this? Should we go there? Should we do that? Is, is it time not to go? But we do our own thing. Do you, do you know that the Bible says to submit to those that have the rule over you? <laughs> Did you know that? It says to so obey them. For they watch for your soul. It, it, it says that. Did you understand that the anointing doesn't flow up? It flows down. And then in our disobedience and our lack of submission to God, it removes us from under the, the spout of the anointing. That if you want to be used of God, you better stay in your place. You better be submissive to God and to submissive to those that God has placed over you. I know it sounds like I'm beating my own drum right now, but I'm telling you, this is not my drum. It's the word of God. Our arrogance, our defiance. I ain't listening to you. I'm doing whatever I want to do. What does it matter what you think? You got to understand that it's, it's just a little deeper than I am. You thought you were just talking to me. Oh no, there was one in the room that heard everything you said. Hey, listen, you that are tormented by the devil, the first thing that you got to learn is submission. We can't help you. We can come and we can dance around your house. We can play the music. We can anoint your windows. We can, we can call on the name of Jesus. And if you're not in submission to God, it ain't happening. I'm sorry. I can pray and fast for you. And if you will not submit to God, it ain't happening. This is, this is how it works, ladies and gentlemen. You see, so what, what some of you are feeling right now is that debilitating factor of humanity that begins to risk uh, to fight against what it hears. Now, I, I know this, this sound, you, you, you place me on your level. I laugh and I joke with you, but I am really a man of God. And I am actually the pastor of this church, believe it or not. So, so that does put me in a position that's just a little bit above you, if you please. But I'm not supposed to glory over it. I'm not supposed to be a Lord, amen, lordly over everybody. No, I'm supposed to be an example. That's what he's called me to be. And so as an example, I must submit myself to him. 
Because I want to be under the anointing too. So the, those that have, are just troubled all the time, the first thing you've got to do is ask yourself, God, how have I got to a place where I'm not submitting to you? What area of my life is lacking in this area? Right? You won't do that. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. I'm just telling you that you're going to continually struggle. And all the medications in the world are not going to help you. Started this out with the fact that in the beginning God, and I, and I told you what it says in Revelation chapter 19. He's going to be, he's going to be, he is, but he's going to be over all the earth, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I, I am coming home, I am coming home right now. Amen. This is, this is hope. Sister Janice, please come to the organ. This is hope for you. I didn't say I was done. I'm just saying this is hope. This is hope. And so, the man of God, Paul, the man of God, Paul, gets knocked down on the road to Damascus by the glory and power of God. And he is himself a man that thought he was worshiping God, but he found out he wasn't worshiping correctly. And he was actually opposing and fighting God. And so when he's laying in the dirt there and he comes to an understanding who God really is, that he is the Lord Jesus, he says, man, what would you have me to do? He goes into Damascus and for three days he prays and fasts until Ananias shows up to give him direction. And he finds out that the rest of his life is going to be preaching the gospel to those Gentiles. And he will become the advocate of the Gentiles. But, but he has an issue. He has, a, he has a problem. He has something that he really struggles with. Everywhere, if you read the book of Acts, everywhere that he goes, those Jews show up that hate him. I mean, they travel long distances to go disrupt the party. They show up everywhere. And when he goes back to Jerusalem, even 40 of them conspire to kill him. And they make a vow, and the Roman soldiers in the, the government have to spirit him out of Jerusalem into Caesarea. And so here he is. Here's the Apostle Paul, this man of great understanding of God's Word, who's been caught up into the third heaven, who has knowledge and understanding that none of us have today in this room. Who the Apostle Peter will say that he writes some things that are hard to understand. And I'm in absolutely agreement with brother, brother Peter. What is Paul talking about sometimes, man? I just don't get it, Paul. Who will say to them, because of your carnality, I cannot share with you my understanding. All right, that man comes to God. And he's got a problem. And I'm sure he had been thinking about it a long time. I can see him as he says, to God, you know, God, if you do something in this area, I could do a much better job. I know you've worked through me, but I'm telling you, God, if you would just help me in this area, I could do better. Paul calls it a thorn in his flesh. Anybody got a thorn? Don't raise your hand if you got a thorn in the flesh. Just keep it to yourself. Perhaps you have a thorn in the flesh just to keep you where God wants you to be. And so when we read the story in 2 Corinthians 12, we're reading a man who now has an understanding of why God has done what he's done. And he's come to realize because of the abundance of revelation that he had received, that this messenger of Satan was going to continually buff him. Why? Paul would say, lest I be exalted above measure. What's he saying? He's saying, I understand the debilitating factor of humanity. That I could be filled with pride. That I could say, look what Paul's done. My God, people have been raised from the dead in my ministry. I have, I have traveled more miles than anybody else has traveled. I've been beaten more than anybody else has been beat. I've been in the sea a day 
in a night. I've been shipwrecked three times. I've been in perils of things that none of you have ever experienced. But God says to him, no, son. I know you want to re me to remove that from you. But then he says something that is so important for us to understand. My grace is sufficient for you. You know, God, you can remove a lot of things out of our life and make it a lot easier for us. May it make us more impactful. If you would just do it. And, and we don't understand what he's doing. That it's through our weakness and through those things that it humbles us to depend upon him. And he wants us to say, as the Apostle Paul said in 12 and 9, God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, our biggest problem is our human factor. And we don't understand it, but it literally is debilitating in the work of God. Secretly, we come up with thoughts about, I could do the job better. You know, if I, if I was in that place, I, my God, I'd really show them how it's supposed to be done. Hey, wise guy. Here's the mic. Come and show us how it's done. My God, there's only one king and only one Lord. And I sure ain't him. I just got a song. I don't know what you're planning on singing. Bow down before the Lord. Worship him. We're going to sing that in just a moment here. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters... You're your own worst enemy. And making all your plans and leaving God outside of them. And thinking that somehow that you are, you would not say this, but you are God. And when you say that you're saying, I'm in control. Are you really in control? Are you so foolish to think that you're in control? You don't even know how long you're going to live. This, this may be your, you may not even get out of this church. But we operate like that. Why did Jesus say, take no thought of tomorrow? For the troubles you got today is sufficient. Because you ain't God. And you don't need to burden yourself with tomorrow. Leave that in his hands. Why did he say, cast all your cares on him? Well, we'll give him the big ones. We'll solve the little ones. What are you doing? What are we doing? You see, that's the debilitating factor of humanity. Somehow we can get this thing done. And in doing that, our arrogance and our pride rises up. And the one that we want to be with us literally begins to resist us. For the scripture says, he gives grace to the humble. But he resists the proud. So here I am today. i got to humble myself before him. He is God. I'm not God. And I need to listen to what his word says. And I need to keep, quit fighting against his word. If his word said be baptized in Jesus' name, then that's what I need to do. If his word said I need to be born again, that's, that's what I need to do. If it tells us there's one God, I need to believe there's one God. All those things... So many more. Hey, have you ever read the scripture where it says we're to submit to one another? It's in there, isn't it? It's in there. Well, I ain't submitting to you, you clown. Uh, I, I know you don't say that, but we do that through our actions. We don't listen. We, we, got, it. we got it together. I don't care how everybody else sees it. They all see it wrong. I see it right. Really? You see, that's the debilitating factor of humanity. We set ourselves up. And we literally we're setting ourselves up for, for a fall. Because he's going to be God. 
He was God in the beginning, and he's going to be God at the end. And all I can do is do, I want to bow before him. I want to acknowledge him, not just with physical actions, but with my heart. Amen. And so as we sing this song this morning, bow down before your God. Worship him. This altar will be open. If you can somehow get to your knees, some of us were so infirmed, it's hard for us to get on our knees. But if you're, you're able to get to your knees, this would be a good day to just drop to your knees and acknowledge that he is God and confess that he is the Lord with more than just your lips, but with your heart. Amen. It's time to sing and it's time to respond to God. The debilitating factor of humanity. My God.